Okay, so we have uh, two people joining us on stage for this next talk. Um, and although from different backgrounds, uh, both are passionate about narrative and storytelling in games. And between them, they have uh, worked on some impressive titles. So please welcome Molly Maloney and Eric Streit. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, my name is Molly Maloney, and I'm a narrative designer, and this is Writing a Narrative Design a Relationship. And my name is Eric Sturpey. I'm a writer. I'm just adjusting her P's here so Thank that she doesn't you. pop quite so much. And uh, um, yeah, uh, up until a couple months ago, uh, we, we, both worked at, uh, we both worked at Telltale Games, uh, where we were lucky enough to get to co-lead uh, co some things. We got to work on... Uh, franchises such as uh, a couple seasons of The Walking Dead, Minecraft Story Mode, Tales from the Borderlands, Batman, Guardians of the Galaxy. We didn't co-lead on all of these. <laughs> but uh, we, we actually left the company a, uh, a couple weeks before it closed. Um, and so this is an updated version of a talk that we wrote for GDC this year. Um, you get the longer version because we got twice as much time. So we get to go into some other things in detail that we didn't get to do, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, while there's obviously been a lot of news about Telltale in the media recently, we really wanted to focus this talk on what we learned in our over five years, uh, both of us, uh, at the company. So that's kind of what this talk is more about. Yeah, so it's a little bit more of a, and it's kind of like a retrospective about things we learned and the techniques and the stuff we got to work on uh, because it's placed them in a lot to us and you know, we have a lot of great memories from there. Yeah, like um, we learned so much about narrative from them. Uh, we met there, mm -hmm. we got married in June. <laughs> so thanks, Telltale. <laughs> um, and uh, it's funny, we originally started discussing the idea for this talk based on a lot of the conversations that we were having with other people. You know, because I'm a writer, she's a narrative designer. What's the difference between them? Uh, what's it like working with the person that you're romantically involved with? Stressful. <laughs> and uh, we started realizing that there were a lot of parallels and that actually the two subjects were related in a lot of ways. So in this talk, we're going to cover basically three things. Um, first of all, the difference between writing and narrative design, because we get asked that a lot. Um, second, uh, how the two, uh, the two disciplines are mutually beneficial to your game in different ways. And then finally, um, we have a section that's more about tips and tricks, uh, because it's great to be practical, about getting the most out of your writer and your narrative designer, as well as um, how to identify when things might be going wrong and how to solve those, those problems in the relationship. So, let's get started. Uh, what is the difference? Oh god, I can do this. Can oh I? My oh my goodness. Uh, maybe you should click. Yeah, one, I'm scared. Okay. I'm scared. Okay. What's the difference between writing and narrative design? <laughs> this is a question that comes up a lot. I think especially because narrative design is a role that's still largely being defined in the video game industry as a whole. I like to joke about this, that if you ask four different narrative designers what narrative design is, you get four completely different answers. <laughs> And uh, you know, and you look at like job listings and writing and narrative design will sometimes be used interchangeably, sometimes they'll be used in combination with each other. But uh, while we were at Telltale, the two roles were distinct. And the thought process on this, uh, the thought process on this, is that writing and designing is a lot for one person to handle. So rather than split a person between these two roles, why not let each person focus on making one thing great? Yeah. So let's start by talking about what that looks like specifically. So. Um, the, simple, uh, the simple definition that we used to use at Telltale was that writing is responsible for the characters and design is responsible for the player. And this is a really simple um, kind of explanation for this, but looking at each of the disciplines through this lens um, provides them with a way to really focus their energy when we're making a game together. Yeah, and so on the writing side, that looks like uh, you got your dialogue, which is what your characters say. You have character arcs, which is how your characters are growing and changing over the course of the story. And then you've got themes and tone, which is kind of the squishy subjective one, but it basically means if you're making it a comedy, make sure it's funny. If you're making a drama, make sure it's dramatic. Have your layers and character stuff in there. And you heard it here first. It is that easy. Just make it dramatic. Just push the drama button. Uh, from the design side, uh, we've got choices and consequences, which is, is the player making choices? And again, this is through the telltale lens, um, but any game has choices, right? Uh, even if they're not dialogue choices, the player is still choosing to do things. And so, what are those choices? Are they paying off? Do they feel consequential? Then we have branching, uh, which is, if I've made a choice and I'm experiencing unique content, do I, the player, know that? Which is very important. 
And then finally, mechanics, which are mechanics. <laughs> Um, something really important to note is that neither of these sides say that either one is responsible for the story uh, because uh, what made the relationship at Telltale unique between writing and narrative design is that they shared story as a deliverable. And uh, so this, this here is, uh, this was the opening title credit from uh, Minecraft Story Mode Episode 5, which is one of the ones we got to work on together. Yeah, it was a really fun one. Um, yeah, we actually share this credit, um, which was kind of cool and kind of reminds, it serves as a great reminder that we are both working on the same thing and we, we share this deliverable together. Um, what's also great about this is it means that you have two people who are responsible for the story rather than one, i.e. the writer. Um, and that allows things like when Eric needs to be feverishly writing in a broom covered, I can go out and talk to people. Um, we can split our time in different ways. Uh, we can be in two places at once. So we have two uh, evangelists for the story instead of one. Which is always awesome. It is always awesome, especially at a larger company. Um, and uh, while our company was 250 people at about its biggest, um, our individual teams, because we'd be working on many things simultaneously, were around 70 people. And even 70 people, as you can imagine, are a lot of people to keep in the loop. Uh, so having two of us was really great. But let's talk about what this looks like on a more practical level. Uh, yeah, because with everything that we've been saying, you know, you could take away that, like, oh, writing and design, they don't need to have a relationship at all. They can just, you know, divide up the work. Like in this classic example from the ever-relevant Brady Bunch. I did not pick the GIFs. <laughs> But it is a good GIF, it's good. Um, so like looking at that previous slide, right, with the categories, uh, I really feel like it would be easy to say, oh, that's cut and dry. Uh, this is my piece of pie and this is your piece of pie and the writer and the de designer like stay in their lanes. But those roles are generally more of a starting place. Uh, they set us up. We know what our deliverables are, individual things that we're looking out for, but it's not a paint by number on the balance of responsibilities between those disciplines. When writing a narrative design, we may have different priorities, but our goal, as we said before, is the same, which is to make a great story, make a great game together. Um, and that's gonna, unfortunately, sometimes involves stepping on each other's toes and getting in each other's business. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and that's one of the ways that it's really like a personal relationship too, you know, because like in a personal relationship, it, it's never a great sign if you're dividing up like chores or responsibilities, like doing dishes is only ever your job. Because then if that person goes out of town, you're not going to be like, oh, I don't want to step on You're not going to leave a sink of dishes for me. <laughs> I don't want to step you on your toes not. and clean the dishes. Yeah, so no, you, this, you wouldn't do that to a personal partner. So, you know, why would you do that to your creative partner? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, basically, the point is that we like to, sharing um, the responsibilities means that it's never one person's sole responsibility. Nobody is crushed under the weight of this responsibility of, like, this is my thing. It also prevents... Um, when you divide up the work, uh, it can lead to weird feelings of possessiveness, uh, as well as ownership, and uh, ownership is good, but uh, when you feel like only you own something, uh, that can lead to some negative feelings too. Sharing things reminds you that we are sharing uh, this game experience together, building a game as a team and collaborative effort. Um, so let's go through a really quick version of the Telltale process, and this is basically how Telltale made games in a lot of ways, and we want to showcase how the balance of power between writing and de design evolves and changes over the course of making one of our episodes. Yeah, so first we're going to start with uh, pre-production. And uh, this is where you, uh, you would have your lead designer and your, and your lead writer paired up to put an episode together. And they're responsible for making the outline and that initial story. And uh, it's funny, we've been talking about the difference between writing and narrative design up until now. But what's amusing is that here, actually, the difference it's, it, there's not that much of one because it's going to be a lot of both of you sitting around talking and just thinking. Yeah, sometimes for weeks, um, sometimes longer. Uh, so what you expect from the pre-production phase is a lot of whiteboard time. Um, it's you and your writer or your designer sitting in a room coming up with cool ideas um, and, uh, and, and just spitballing and seeing what would make a great game together. Um, not pictured in this is probably your producer standing just outside of frame with a Wonder, baseball bat. Yeah, wondering why you can't just start <laughs> writing already. Uh, because, you know, what better way to make the creative process work than, you know, it's like a hose, right? Yeah. You just turn it on. Of course. And it just happens on a schedule always. Always. We actually love our producers. One of them was in our wedding party. No. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing that is the thing that is different between writing and design at this phase is uh, is what you're focusing on. It's like those lenses we were talking about before, where writing's focusing on making the character uh, driven uh, journey and making it really compelling. 
And design is trying to make that journey uh, fun and playable. Yeah. Really, it's that simple. Um, we had a great example on an episode of Minecraft Story Mode that we were doing together. And this one actually didn't get made for various reasons. But we wanted to do an origin story of, uh, of one of our like kind of you know uh, action hero type characters. And uh, I had this idea. I thought it would be really cool to have him uh, start off. You know, you see him as a big hero, and so let's let's start off by showing him as a little sidekick whose job is to do nothing but craft sticks all day for the other cooler heroes. I don't know if you remember what crafting sticks was like in Minecraft. <laughs> It's, it, it's relatively simple. <laughs> but, you know, and so I was like, okay, this character, you know, we get to see him when he, when he, was, this, when he was this young guy. He's going to start off bored and hating his life, and, you know, but we know he's destined for greatness. And all I'm hearing is, I'm the player, and I'm bored, and I'm hating my life, and I'm having a panic attack. <laughs> right. So we talked about it, because obviously we don't want the player or the character to be bored. And, uh, but what I loved about it was if you have a character who starts off bored and hating their life, you know, you know where the trajectory of the story is going to take them. Yeah, that trajectory is going to take me, the player, to directly uninstalling that game. Um, but seriously, like, it's not like this is a movie, and, uh, and, and this, is a, this is a tale as old as time. Like, uh, the writer wants to do a really cool thing that makes a lot of sense from a character place, but as the player, I'm freaking out. You know, like, how am I gonna make this playable? And uh, in a movie, it would be simple. We'd make that a montage. Yeah. Um, but. So, they, so, you know, they, so I heard what Molly was saying, and we had a lot of conversations about it and tried to find a way to punch it up. And so I said, okay, what if he was super positive about the fact that he has these boring jobs to do all day? Like, he's an optimist. You know, even though he had, all he has to do all day is make sticks, he's not going to let it get him down. He's a, he's a fighter. He's spunky. Oh, my God. So, um, but weirdly, uh, something about Eric saying this weird positive thing, I was like, what could we make crafting sticks positive? Could we make that a positive experience? It actually helped me out. It made me think in a different way. And so suddenly the idea of this character being super passionate about his crappy job uh, gave me an idea. And we ended up developing a super over the top mechanic for what this looked like in that character's head, where all of a sudden I'm playing the thing that I think is as cool as the character does, even though in real life it's just super mundane. And so it was this Parappa the Rapper meets DDR thing where it's like pounding that wood together, making these amazing sticks. And it was fun, it was funny, and we laughed a lot, and I'm really sad it didn't get made. But um, at the end of the day, that character was still trying to get out of his crappy job, but the player was having a fun time. And I feel like that's a great example of, it would have been easy for me as a designer to say, no, like do not make this story arc. But we came up with an interesting idea in spite of that together that we would have never come up with by ourselves. And frankly, the end product was, was probably a lot better for it. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. And, and, and I really love that story just because I think it's a great example of writing and design going back and forth with kind of each of their different perspectives to just try and make the thing better and being really collaborative, which is, you know, how it should be. Exactly. But, uh, you know, is it, it always like it, that, though? It, funny you should ask is no, it doesn't always go that smoothly because uh, developing that healthy level, that healthy level of collaboration uh, takes time and trust. And, uh, it, if you're, and your partner is always going to have ideas that you don't necessarily agree with. So now that we've told you the rosy example of how everyone can get along and it's kumbaya, let's talk about what happens when writing and design might disagree. Right, because if your partner's pitching and loving an idea that you don't like, it's really, really important to make sure that you get on the same page as soon as possible. And there are certain like red flags and bad habits that we've seen along the way that uh, are really not the correct way to handle those disagreements. So let's talk about our first bad habit. Um, and we're going to talk about two types of people. Um, so there are some people, some people, just you know, theoretical people, that when they hear an idea that they don't like, they just nod in agreement to everything that you're saying while secretly hoping that someone else, anybody else really will kill the idea for them uh, because they hate confrontation. In case you can't tell, she's talking about me. <laughs> and uh, this is one that's bitten me in the butt in the past. Um, like, I've bitten you in the butt about it. <laughs> Wait, that sounded wrong. Please go on. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I was working Did on- I throw it. you off? <laughs> <laughs> I was working on an episode of Telltale's Batman series, and uh, there was a scene that people really, really wanted. You know, they, they had this idea for how it should go, and like they, you know, they were like, oh, it'll be great, it'll be real, the player will never see it coming. And I didn't really get it, I didn't really believe in it, but I just said, yeah, sure, I'll try and write that. 
um, when what I should have told them was that I didn't actually believe in it. But I didn't want to rock the boat, and so I figured, you know what, I'll write it the way they want it, I'll wait for a table read, someone else will hate it, and then they'll shut it down, and then I'll get to fix it the way I want. A victimless crime. That Did it go that way? Did that happen? <laughs> no, because you know what? Table read came along. Uh, there were people that didn't like the scene, and they said, yeah, we need to fix this. Let's get someone else to do it. So I didn't. Uh. Even get to, so I was the victim, and yeah. I didn't even get to fix it like I wanted to, which was my fault. And uh, the big lesson I learned there is that staying silent about things you don't like is never, ever the right answer. Which is not to say you be a dick about it, but you know, it's like, it's okay to say you don't like something if you can articulate why that is yeah. and maybe come up with a suggestion for something that might be better, you yeah. know? Because holding your tongue, that's just gonna hurt the rest of the team, it could hurt your game, and that's the last thing you want. And uh, that was a big thing for me to learn because I don't know if you've picked up on this yet, but like that's me in life too, it's not just work. Like I'm not a big <sighs> confrontation guy. Um, which I would say is a really great transition into the other side of the spectrum. Right, because as I've learned in my life, there are people who don't have a problem with confrontation, who, crazy as it seems, might even say that they like confrontation. Well, A, it's not confrontation. It's communication. Right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so there's a designer that I've worked with before uh, who, when they hear an idea they don't like, <laughs> they might have a harder time hiding that they don't like it. I feel like we all know this person, and or so, we are this person. And uh, she, or he, or he, or he they, uh, they, uh, they, they might get hung up on it and keep coming back to it over and over and over and over again until they kill it, even if it derails other conversations. So this is, this is me. Um, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I like to call it hyper-communication. I'm a hyper-communicator. Um, if something is wrong, I want to see it fixed right away. Like, I don't want us to get derailed by this weird thing. And so uh, that's something that I have trouble with. A, probably the fact that I see it as wrong and needs to be fixed is the origin point of this issue. But uh, this is something that I really had to work on a lot when I was working with a team because, surprise, people don't like it when you do this. Um, <laughs> And uh, the, there were a couple of things that I did that kind of helped me get through it. And honestly, it's not something you're ever really cured of, it's a process. Um, but the first thing was just listening. And as it turns out, listening is not waiting for another person to stop talking so that you can say the thing you want to say, um, which is what I thought it was. Um, it's actually letting people finish before casting judgment on their, on their opinions, um, which can be hard, uh, but is very important. And then the other thing was, just the idea of trusting the team. And I always trusted the team, but when I did this kind of behavior, it made the team feel like I did not trust them. And uh, everyone is trying to work hard together. Obviously we get into games, each of us, because we wanna tell a story, we wanna make something amazing together. And, uh, and it's important to trust each other in that. Uh, I found that over time, being obstinate in a meeting it never convinced anybody anyway, and it honestly just made me look like a jerk, uh, which worked at cross purposes with everything that I was trying to achieve. Surprise, nobody wants to do what you want to do when they think you're a jerk. So that was my struggle. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing was like, you know, these, these would be conversations that we started having more and more because, you know, like I was saying, they weren't just professional issues for us, they were like issues that were bleeding into our personal lives as well, and uh, being in a personal relationship while working together forced us to actually deal with that stuff head on. Uh, yeah, I mean, ordinarily, I would have gone home to my boyfriend and complained about my jerk writer. But suddenly, I was the jerk writer. You were writer. the jerk writer, so we really had to talk about it, unfortunately. Well, actually, fortunately, right? Like, I would not have fixed a lot of the problems that I experienced if I hadn't actually been dating my partner. Same. Um, so in our experience, these two bad habits, which you could simplify basically as over-communication and under-communication, they're the root of most of the problems we saw in partnerships, not just writing and design partnerships, but any partnerships. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's a really important set of problems to get under control because if it's causing issues and friction in pre-production, it's only gonna get worse as you start like, you know, making something more together. Surprise, yeah, <laughs> it just gets worse over time. And, uh, and a telltale that meant you know, actually putting the script together, which was a really collaborative process between writing and design. So I thought it would be fun if we talk a little bit about how Telltale made scripts because it was a really interesting process. Um, and it involved something that uh, we called stubbing, um, which I hear is actually a programming term, but it was Telltale's term for a design's contribution to the script. 
And that is where design basically maps out the nodes and the choices and the branches that, of the scene in our dialogue tool or our, our proprietary software. So at Telltale, narrative designers were usually the first ones to uh, work in the scene files that became the script. And uh, by leading this phase, we were actually able to ensure that those files did not become too passive because this is a player experience. You want the player to be driving. Um, but that doesn't mean we go crazy. Um, we're basically just taking the information that we whiteboarded together in that pre-production phase and translating that on into the script format to jog the writer's memory. Right. Uh, and writing is able to then come in and use that framework to uh, go in and write the dialogue. And uh, I would have a lot of writers who would, who would talk to me when I'd explain this process, and they'd say, oh, doesn't that feel like design is telling you what to do? Doesn't it feel like someone else is doing your job for you? But the truth is that like, because it was all based on things that we had talked about ahead of time, it meant that actually when you open up, you know, when you open up a file, there's, there's not a blank page waiting for you. There's already a rough structure, and it saves a lot of time and energy in the planning phase. But again, it only works if there's that trust and, and uh, communication in the relationship between writer and narrative designer. And uh, so we thought it'd be fun to, that we got some screenshots here of uh, some stuff we actually worked on together to show you a little bit more what that looks like. So this is an actual thing that got made and we'll show you the end product at the end. Um, so here's what a choice in the Telltale tool looked like. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so uh, this is from the big exciting finale of Minecraft Story Mode Episode 5 Season 1, which Eric and I worked on together. And um, the choice that we're looking at here comes in when our hero, Jesse, is confronting the villain of the episode, Aiden. Uh, and Jesse's basically trying to take back this MacGuffin uh, called the Eversource. Which is a magic chicken. <laughs> I love making kids games. If you don't like making kids games, you're crazy. Um, they're so fun. Uh, so anyway, the blue node at the top, uh, basically everything that lives inside of that blue node is our non-interactive cutscenes. And then the yellow nodes, uh, that is predominantly everything you're seeing, those are the individual choices. So let's break that open and take a look. So I'm gonna try to give a super fast overview because obviously it's a little dense. Um, but basically here we've got the cutscene that is preceding our choice. And what I've done here, this is all the work that I do and what I've done here is the blue director's notes are basically explaining things that happen. Um, these are things that the player is seeing. Uh, the pink stubs are stand-in lines uh, that I want the writer to write. Mm -hmm. um, and again, these are just my like taking a stab at what we talked so uh, what we talked about in pre-production so that Eric isn't just starting from scratch. Yeah, and Molly and I have stubbed and written for each other a lot. And, uh, and so, you know, they, so we kind of ha have a good shorthand for working back and forth with each other. Exactly. One of the first things you want to do with your partner is sit down and talk about how they prefer to work so that you find something that's good together. Every writer and designer is different, and I would imagine other disciplines are the same. So um, sitting down and finding the version of this that worked with my writers was always the first part of ramping onto a new project. So I'll run through this really fast, um, what, what's going on here. So um, we've got this character, Reggie, who is really surprised to see you because he actually thought you were dead in the last scene. Uh, Aiden, the villain, he doesn't like being ignored by Reggie. Uh, so Aiden spawns a creeper right near Reggie, and the creeper explodes, incapacitating Reggie, and Reggie's in some pain, and we need a line for that. And then um, Aiden turns his attention to you, the player, and uh, Aiden cannot believe that Jesse is still alive. How many times does he have to kill you? Um, and that last stub is probably a little more specific than the others, and that's actually because that was what we called the feeder line. And a feeder line is any line, the last line, that tees up a choice, so the choice comes after. Yeah, and so that's one that writing and design do a lot of back and forth about because the, uh, the language of the feeder line is going to inform a lot of uh, how the actual choices are phrased. So it's kind of a shared custody thing. Totally. Uh, then there are the individual choices themselves. And I'm actually not as particular about how these are stubbed because the display text conveys most of what I need already. And display text, um, if you've ever played a choice-based game, display text is our word for the face button text that you click. Um, if you've ever played a game where you click the text and it, uh, the character said something that was different than you intended, that's display text. And sometimes it can be misleading. So. Um, Anyway, I get most of what I need for the writer out in that display text, and so the stub is re relatively light. So we've got three choices here. We've got, you've lost Aiden, which is kind of our badass choice. We've got, you thought it would be that easy, which I'm hoping will be kind of a snarky choice. 
And then we've got give me the Eversource, which is kind of your to the point pragmatic choice. Yeah, and like Molly was saying before, designer writer pairs, you know, approached stubbing and, and writing in different ways. Like there were some writers who preferred, oh, actually just getting like a paragraph describing here's what needs to be in this cutscene. Or there are people who wanted more specific dialogue stubs, and they, this is, you know, this is the version that we liked best. Uh, and so after all that, I'm able to uh, come in and use these uh, stubs as the basis for writing the cutscene. A dramatic reading of uh. your fine work. Uh, yeah. So uh, so Jesse, the hero, has just run into the room. And uh, Aiden's eyes widen, looking over Reggie's shoulder. Reggie turns. Oh my good gosh, you're alive! You're alive! And, and so I've got a note in here saying that Reggie's whole purpose is serving the founder, so that's why I put in this next line, because I want to get a mention in about he her. He went off stub. Went off stub. <laughs> then that must mean, is the founder alive too? Is she with you? Aiden, you know, the, the villain is annoyed that he's not being uh, talked to. Hey, I'm not done talking to you. He spawns that creeper near Reggie. What the? The creeper explodes, incapacitating him, blowing him backwards. Ah! Jesse comes running over. Reggie! Th but Aiden threatens Jesse, says, not one more step. Jesse halts as Aiden stands from the throne, getting angry. I killed you once. I can do it again. You were a fool to come back here, Jesse. And scene. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think this is feeling pretty good at this point. You know, I like I've put in those notes, saying that I've kind of tweaked and changed the dur notes in a couple spots. I've tried to amp up the drama, add some character beats. Um, the only problem is now it's starting to feel a little long. And I, I we've never rehearsed this, so I'm going off script now. But we actually. Um, that writing note, we would communicate a lot in the script this way, um, where we'd leave notes for each other actually in the script. So next time I take a look, if I haven't talked to Eric, I can see that note and that lets me know why this magical line showed up that I might want to cut. Yeah. Um, so uh, I actually think Eric's idea for that new line was really good. Uh, it was an interesting character beat that I hadn't considered. Um, but when you read it all out loud, it is getting kind of long with no player interactivity. This is essentially a cutscene. Yeah. And so, you know, surprise, writers love writing lines. Why well, have one when you can have three? <laughs> writers gonna write. Um, so what? another thing that I do, and what, one of the reasons why I actually think it's really great to have two of us, is now I get to serve as a pair of eyes that has is not attached to these lines. Like, I don't know if it took Eric 20 minutes to come up with this brilliant line. All I'm doing is looking at the thing that exists now. And so part of what I do is I can actually look for potential cuts, again, through that lens of the player experience. Like, what is the player going to, going to respond to and what is going to move us into the interaction more quickly? Uh, keep the player in the driver's seat. So I would actually suggest that we cut these two lines as they're not totally necessary. And, you know, heaven forbid, we have things that aren't totally necessary. <laughs> Yes. And then finally, um, I actually really like what Eric was going for with this last line. Uh, but one, uh, the one before it is actually going to lead into the choice space a lot better. So I would suggest we cut or move it as well. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the, and it's this kind of stuff going, the back, uh, the going back and forth and having the notes for each other. It's something that's better coming from your partner than it is coming from an executive, someone else down the road. Yeah, we actually serve as like uh, the first line of defense. Like we are going to have to stand this concept up in front of a lot of people. And so having the sounding board is really useful. Yeah, and if it were a line that I was really passionate about, I know it's also something we'd be, we'd be able to have a discussion about. Totally. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to move on to the choices next. And Molly knows I, you know, like Molly was saying, she leaves these a little bit more open-ended, and I have a lot of fun writing stuff like this. So this is always, uh, you know, this is always a good time. And uh, and so this became, you know, that badass choice turned into, you know, just you and me, Aiden. Just you and me now. You got your snarky one, which is give me some credit, Aiden. I'm a lot harder to kill than that. And we got the to the point, which is, you know, we don't need to fight Aiden. All I want is the chicken. So I hand it over. Which somehow you managed to make that line funny, which I liked. Um, and uh, Eric really took uh, this particular stub uh, for You've Lost Aiden. He took that and ran with it uh, and did kind of a new line that I really like, but it actually doesn't match the display text as well as I was hoping. Um, but I like the line so much that I will actually update this display text to match it instead. Um, so it really is give and take. Like sometimes the lines are so great, we change the design around them a little bit. Yeah, and so and it's a great example of those different lenses really enhancing the process because you know I'm focusing on writing the characters as they're experiencing the scene, and Molly's focusing on the player as they'll be experiencing the game. You know, holding the controller in their hand. So let's look at how that scene actually shipped in our game. You're alive! You're alive! Is the founder with you? Ah! What the? 
Not one more step! I killed you once! I can do it again! Just you and me, Aiden. Just you and me now. Uh, Who knew yeah. Minecraft could be so dramatic? Um, <laughs> but... Uh, and, and, and obviously, the, the other piece of the puzzle here is, uh, is our amazing cinematic director, John Stouter, who actually you know, took the stuff that we were writing and got recorded and you know, turned it into the very awesome stuff that you saw on the screen there. Yeah, one of the things that we're responsible for doing together is we pitch the rest of the team on a lot of this stuff. So by getting cinematics excited, we get amazing scenes back. So also an aspect in which the relationship between us is so important. Yeah, and Molly was talking about, you know, when like writing is crammed away in that cupboard, like actually writing the script, you know, a great thing that design can be doing is They're going They're not in actually in a cupboard. Not always. <laughs> um, the, but design can be off working with the cinematics team, getting them excited to actually start putting it together, which is really cool. When we know what each other like, also, Eric may be in love with a scene that I'm not as in love with, but because I know he cares about it, I'll fight for it while he's not around. Um, and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, we're getting toward the end of the talk now, um, but we thought it would be really useful to share kind of what happens when writing design might be a little less balanced and what that can look like. Um, and what I mean by this is kind of, it's useful to be able to identify when one discipline might be overpowering the other and why that can be counterproductive for your game. Right. So, first up, we've got some signs that your game might be suffering from something that I've decided to call writing domination. That sounds kind of dramatic. I think it okay. sounds... Yeah, no, it makes you feel powerful. Sounds cool. It sounds cool. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so what does that include? That includes things like uh, cutscenes where your player character is feeling all sorts of emotions that maybe you, the player, do not feel. This is things like my player character is currently sobbing on screen about a character that has died that maybe the player has never met before. Yeah, where it's like, okay, you're sad, I get it, I see that my player character is sad, but do I feel sad? No, I'm just kind of watching and along for the ride. This may also include uh, giving the player a diverse range of dialogue choices that are actually only saying one thing. This is, uh, this is things like, you know, I maybe want to maybe wanna be able to express that I'm happy or angry, but actually all four choices are only giving me different variations of sad. And we would see this a lot in branching content um, when a writer got really excited about a specific line or a piece of a, a, a scene. Uh, they want, you know, it's, it's so hard to work in branching content because some of your favorite things may actually get hidden uh, behind a choice or something. And so sometimes they'll, you know, the writer will actually really want to force you to see that amazing content. It's really, um, it's an easy trap to fall into. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then finally, uh, we have uh, you know the example of the player only reacting to what other more interesting characters are doing in the story. You know, this is where uh, you know the player character isn't that interesting, and we've we've just surrounded them with uh, with NPCs that have all sorts of colorful opinions and things to say. Yeah, when your player character is basically just reacting to the cool things that other characters are doing, that can be a warning sign. Yeah, it's basically become a story you're being told instead of one you're driving. <laughs> On the flip side, um, if you've got, uh, we have these signs basically that design might be throwing a little, a little too much weight around. Um, the first of which is you get these super to the point lines uh, that tell you exactly where to go and what to do because clarity is king. It's very important. Go there, get the ammo, do the thing. Sometimes these lines are really important um, because the player might be doing a lot of things and you want to make sure that they get that instruction. But an overuse of that, it just starts to feel like you're doing chores. Um, so that can be a problem. Uh, the next one is mechanics for the sake of mechanics. I always like to joke, what better way to amp up the emotional stakes of your scene than a sick round of shuffle puck? Like, this is when designers work on mini games or small mechanics that they're really excited about, but they may not have been communicating with their writers. So you'll get back a scene that is really uh, a cool scene and a mini game or a mechanic that is really cool, but when you shove them together, they disrupt each other. The better version is to explain to your writer what you're trying to develop so that they can develop dialogue that supports and, and emphasizes that thing rather than cramming the two together. And then finally, We've got the old, no one can be interesting except the player, uh, ever, which I like to call dumb NPC syndrome. And uh, have you ever been in a game where it's like everyone is standing around waiting by a door, but nobody will open it because they're waiting for you? And it's like, come on, you can open the door. You can you do it. You open that door better like, than anyone. Right. Or like I'm the, junior, I'm the rookie detective and I'm surrounded by pro cops, but nobody can solve the crime but me. And, you know, on one hand, 
this is good, I'm the player, I should get to do all the cool stuff. On the other hand, we should try to find some narrative ways to explain why it has to be us. Like maybe my NPC friend's uh, parents got killed by a doorknob and they don't touch those anymore. I don't know. <laughs> do you like that? Sorry. I went off book. <laughs> you can't control me. <laughs> We're obviously describing exaggerated worst case scenarios here to be funny, but hopefully it's getting to the root of what we've been talking about this whole time. And if you take away any from this, anything from this talk, I, I hope it's uh, with the stuff that's on this slide. And that's, uh, first of all, that having those lenses through which you evaluate your game are really important. You know, having uh, writing focus on the characters, design focus on the player, but making sure that both are sharing the story, because that means that, you know, you're, you have two people working in tandem and neither one is a monopoly, which is great, because, you know, making a game's a team effort. And then finally, um, if the writer and the designer are not supporting each other in the room, then chances are good the writing and design are not supporting each other in your game. Like, and it's honestly, it's really that simple. Like, uh, anytime you, you, you have these conflicts, it directly comes out in the thing that you're making. So kind of figuring out what's going on in your relationship and trying really hard to have a positive working relationship directly affects the quality of the game in my experience. Um, we learned all of this the hard way um, through actual, a lot of, you know, uh, difficult conversations, I would say. Uh, and, uh, and we kind of developed this talk to allow other people to do it maybe without having to go through that trial and tribulation. Yeah, because, you know, you might not be dating your partner, but you are in a relationship with them, whether you like it or not. And, you know, the honesty and trust we've been talking about, it's just as important at work as it is at home. So, you know, just be nice to each other. Be nice to each other. <laughs> Um, so really quick, I want to thank Consul for having us back this year. Thank it was you so really much. amazing. Also, big shout out to all of my buddies at Telltale who listened to this talk about 37,000 times. Uh, really appreciate them. Uh, and we thought... And thank you, you guys. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, and we'll open up for questions. Also. <laughs> if there's time, I don't know what time it is. Is there time? Oh, good, 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 good. Um, yes, yeah, so I would like to uh, <clears throat> ask, uh, how do you design the uh, quiet choices that every single Telltale game has? Like uh, the dot, 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 or if you don't respond in time? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, those have a, uh, they, yeah, they, there's, a, there's a lot of conversation that goes into those, actually. They're actually Eric's favorite. Well, they, well so what's so funny about them is uh, they're only, so, uh, they, so we have the stats for, like, every game that we work on. We get to see the stats for not just those end-of-game stats, but, like, who picks what percentage of every single choice. And if you add it up, only about 0.5% of players pick uh, the silent options. Which make them my least favorite. Right. And so, <laughs> then, and, and so what ends up happening is, like, you know, you get a lot of people who say, why would we, make, why would we make waste money animating or doing anything? Thing on the uh, you know on those silent options if so few people are going to see them but the truth is that like they, 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 uh, they well a there's some design reasons for them they allow us to have those timers that make you feel stressed and rushed which is pretty cool but yeah you, you have a good time working no on they, those. and I think and, and I think it's a, I think it's a really fun place to see things because like I saw this especially with Minecraft story mode where you'd have people that would intentionally put up videos on YouTube or whatever that are just you know like oh the the all silent playthrough like they like the version of this episode where you don't pick any buttons. And, uh, and so we started actually having a really good time with like, you know, uh, trying to come up with versions of things where it's like, okay, what, can we make a version of this scene if the player doesn't do anything through the whole thing? And so they, and, and so there are actually some, and so there's some incredible versions of, uh, of scenes um, that, that just end up becoming the, the, these almost like just packed with physical comedy and slapstick stuff where it's like the player's not saying anything as just all this crazy stuff I is like going on. I like to joke that um, silent choices were your opportunities to put ridiculous humor into the game. Oh yeah, because no You would sneak some crazy stuff in those. Because no one ever checks them. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a weird version of, um, they're not silent, but it was Guardians of the Galaxy episode five, and we had this finale fight, and it was set to the song Crazy On You, um, and so it was perfectly choreographed uh, to this music, um, thanks to Jason Latino, our director, who somehow made that work. Um, but it was an action sequence, so it had these QTEs in it, and I really wanted it from a design philosophy. It was like, 
it was the culmination of uh, five episodes, and you you had to win, like you had to feel good. Um, but you were Peter Quill from Guardians of the Galaxy, and so what happened if you failed? And so we had on one side you were like a total badass if you were just acing it. On the other side, it's basically a Jackie Chan fight uh, where you're just drunk fooing your way through the entire thing, and it's pretty funny yeah. as well. Also set to crazy on you, so they choreographed it twice. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have a lot of fun with like weird dead stick or silent stuff. But like I think the other thing too is it's like um, they, uh, they, there, there are some games at Telltale that I think use the silent option to not even just the comedy stuff that we're talking about, but I think um, uh, Batman and Wolf Among Us are two great examples of games that use it to really good effect because um, in both of those you're someone who like you know is clearly meant to be a very intimidating character, and so we had great instances of that silent option being like oh man like you know if someone's begging Batman for forgiveness and he chooses to say nothing. Like it that. feels really Batman-y. Yeah. yeah, and so then, and so, and so, it's something that, especially like folks who were first coming in, that might be saying like, I don't know, like what you want me to write something for where they do nothing? Like I don't know how that works. And it's like by trying to embrace the idea of like, okay, what would this actually be like if you were talking to a person and they just said nothing to you? And uh, yeah, so they, they they were fun and interesting. Um, I was just wondering what your some of your favorite scenes you've worked on, or the favorite scene you've made. Oh man, do you have one off the top of your head? Um, there's a scene that I really love from Tales from the Borderlands, uh, episode three, where it was, um, it's a scene where uh, the main, the main, one of the main characters, Reese, is talking to his best friend, Vaughn. Like they've been on three episodes so far of this crazy adventure, and you know, they, they had been these like stuffy businessmen up until then, and it's a conversation between the two of them, uh, reminiscing, about, uh, reminiscing about trying to get into a party in college. Um, and uh, the thing I really like about it is it's, a, is it's in the middle of all this craziness and it's like all this wild stuff is going on. I think it's just such a great reminder of the friendship that's between the two of them because like, I really believe that friendship was at the core of that series. And, um, and so yeah, it, it made me really happy to be able to uh, get that in there because those kinds of quieter moments are sometimes a little bit harder to fight for, especially in a big over the top um, franchise like that where it's like, you know, you want to keep the, the momentum moving and truck it along all the time. So I was really, really happy that we got that one in there. I love that one. I can think of two scenes that I really enjoyed. Both are from Guardians. Um, one was uh, Guardians episode one. We actually did these flashbacks with young Peter Quill um, with your mother. And uh, I had a really fun time designing a scene where it was between a mother and son. And you know, um, I don't know if you know much about Guardians or if you're a fan, but um, Peter was raised by a strong single mom and I'm raised by a strong single mom. And so it was a really great opportunity for me to design a scene about how cool uh, single moms are and how understanding they can be um, and how that relationship is kind of different than um, you know, uh, different parent relationships. So I really liked that one. And then um, the other was from episode five. It was a completely conditional scene where you could alienate Gamora and drive her out of your party. And then you had to get her back and convince her to return with you. And uh, what was really fun about it was there were lots of crazy conditionals in the scene. You could have, her sister Nebula in this series could have been dead or not. Um, and she could be upset about a variety of different things. So from a design point of view, it was just fun because there was like, so many moving pieces. Um, and then on top of it, there were some, uh, you know, it's Gamora and Peter. They kind of have some will they, won't they chemistry between them. And so providing choices that allowed players to express that or not. Like it was just like from a design standpoint, it was a really layered scene. So it was fun to make. Hi, do you have any tips for young people or students who want to get into writing or narrative design? Oh man. Yeah, no, they, well, so, you know, so it's so funny. This is definitely a question that comes up a lot. And it's really funny because both of us had kind of like strange paths that we had to get, uh, to, get to our current roles. Like, so I actually started out writing, um, I started out writing cartoons uh, and then, um, and, uh, but I've been a huge gamer my whole life and ended up at Telltale and kind of a crazy circuitous way and and then Molly started as a uh, started as a concept artist um, and so uh, but I think you know looking at the state of the industry and kind of you know what people are doing I think there's so many amazing free tools that are out there and it sounds kind of 
trite, and, but like honestly, just making games and putting them online and sharing them with people is such a great way of just starting to get yourself out there. Yeah, I think I started getting into specifically the type of game I love to design for, the branching narrative game um, through Bioware's offerings. Like they have many great games. I played a lot of Knights of the Old Republic. Um, and getting into it as a player, uh, oftentimes you know you find yourself being like, that's not what I would have wanted to say. Like, or I really wish I could say this. And when I started transitioning into this role, um, honestly, a lot of it was just kind of working with those instincts. But there are a lot of great free um, pieces of software out there, like um, what is it, Ink? I think. Yeah, yeah, Ink's amazing, and then Fungus. They, 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 there's a lot Fungus of really great stuff. Fungus is a great stuff. plugin for Unity. It's Twine. actually a visual software plugin, but um, or visual visual novel so uh, software. But it's really good. Yeah. Um, and so um, yeah, there's like stupidly, it's just like making things and I know that can be scary just starting to make stuff but even if it's just writing something yourself and adapting it to being playable and I think um and I, th I think to kind of jump on what you were saying about the instincts thing too like I think um a really important thing is have is knowing what you like knowing what you don't like and being able to talk articulately and intelligently about it and also being able to find things that you like and maybe something that you don't think you like and vice versa and that's true I play a ton of games that are not branching games um, and I feel like it's just like understanding it sounds like weirdly hippie ish but like understanding why you feel about things and really it's not easy it's not as easy as saying I don't like this like any child can say, I don't like it. <laughs> but how do you articulate that in a way that is productive um, and articulate what would make it better? Or when you find something that you dislike, ask what you would do to make it better. And it's kind of, everything starts from that seed, I think. Like, how could I make this better? So. I hope there's something there. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Or, or we're just, you know, faking it. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so you mentioned you prefer or uh, really liked uh, working on uh, games aimed at children. Uh, how are they different uh, in regards to relations or, I mean... I'm going to yeah. start. I know you have a lot of feelings on this, so I'm going to jump in ahead. Um, I actually think they're not that different. Um, weirdly, what is it about children's media that makes us dumb it down for them? Like, I feel like kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. and. They like things that are older. Like, it's mostly um, not shying away from complicated issues, but rather making them in a way that is is um, relevant. And um, obviously, we wouldn't dump a bunch of swear words in. But you know, uh, yeah. I feel like there's a lot of things that they have in common. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like I was saying before, um, you know, before working in games, I I, I wrote a, um, I wrote I wrote cartoons, and uh, and so that was a lot of writing for kids. And one of the things I was always a passionate believer in is that you know kids deserve just high just as high quality storytelling and characters as as more adult mediums. And uh, and yeah, and so I think making something for kids, the biggest thing is just really yeah, finding what are the like what are the really relatable things that like if you like. Finding the jokes, finding the emotional moments, finding the sad things that like an adult and a kid would both be able to get, like you know. The, and so for for me, kind of that bread and butter is finding like is finding a moment that like you might show to a parent and child, and then and like the the child might say, "Oh man, that reminds me of something that happened at school today." At the exact same time that a parent is like, "That reminds me of a thing that happened at work." And so I think if you can find the stuff that really really resonates on all ages, like I think that that's the sweet spot. Well. And a lot of the things, like everything that I make, you never want your stuff to feel the same, but it's always great to find a core in the things that you're working on that really resonates with you. Like the episode of Minecraft that we were showing, that was my first leadership role. And I had a lot of trouble, honestly, being a lead for the first time. And so weirdly, a lot of themes that developed in that episode were about Jessie, the protagonist, having struggling with her own leadership. And while that was very resonant to me, it is also something that I feel like is resonant to kids. And so it's finding the versions of the things, because we change, but the, the things that bother us as adults probably bothered us as kids too. <laughs> so kind of starting there from a place of, um, of heart and, and building it around that. Man, we could just dance up here as well. I mean. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, actually, I have uh, two questions, one of them being uh, 
what are some of your favorite choices or uh, choice tropes uh, of like an ultimate choice that doesn't involve a character dying? And the other one is, do you think it, do you think a game can create a good narrative out of exclusively uh, environmental storytelling? Well, for the second choice, yes. Um, for the first choice, um, oh man, one that didn't involve somebody dying. I actually dislike choices that involve killing somebody because I feel like they're really... Um, it's an easy trap to fall into. Manipulative, <laughs> uh, which is okay. Like There are definitely times and places for that, um, but it is easy to use it. Um, yeah. uh, Got I don't. It. I don't know if I don't know if I can think of any. I don't. Think, I don't know if I can think of a specific one right now. But I, I have a specific one. Oh, okay, then I guess I I'm gonna let you finish. But oh, um, uh, in Tales from the Borderlands, well, there were a ton, um, and I know a lot of people. I, I don't think as many people played that one. But um, one of the things that our director on that project used to say was, um, uh, "I want a choice." that makes people want to go back and play again because both of them are so funny. Like, and so, and that's like a really hard type of choice to make where it's like, not only do you have to come up with a really funny thing, you have to come up with two really funny things. And uh, they had this thing that they called, what was it, Big Fish? Oh, the Big Fish moments, yeah. Big Fish moments where um, Tales from the Borderlands, you played as two different protagonists and you'd switch off between them. And each was an unreliable narrator. And so they'd be trying to make each other look bad while they made themselves look good when they were explaining how the story went. And there was one that was like, what was it, break his heart? Blow his mind, break his heart. Blow his mind, break his heart, where um, Reese, this protagonist, was explaining how amazing uh, his ability to convince August, this other character, um, to give him this vault key, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, he was involved in like a big negotiation. Anyway, one side was him giving this crazy impassioned speech that was like set to amazing patriotic music, and the other side was him literally ripping August's heart out <laughs> and taking the thing that he wanted. And they were both totally ridiculous and over the top, um, but both worth playing and really fun. And, uh, and th that franchise would do that a lot, like with different choices. So uh, I thought they were all really funny. They were hyperbolic, um, but they were really rewarding and nobody usually died. Even though August technically died in one, it was alive, so he didn't really die. Well, mine isn't as specific as that, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, I, but something, something I really like is uh, having a choice where you have the option to be to do something nice for somebody, you know, like let, like let's say like, like like let's say there's this really valuable thing, and you're giving it to character A, and then later on you're having a conversation with character B, and you find out that that was actually their valuable thing, or that like that belonged to them, and you like both of these characters. Now and you've made one person a promise. Right, <laughs> and yeah, and just the idea of promising in one character one thing and then talking to another character later about it, like I, I really like that because I feel like that's the kind of thing that happens a lot in real life, where it, where it's like, yeah, sure, like, like like you know, like tonight let's go grab dinner, and you get home and and, and you know, and someone's like, hey, so we're having dinner tonight, right? And you're like, oh no, <laughs> maybe that's just something that happens to me a lot. <laughs> But, and to Eric's point, like, that's the kind of thing, it requires a lot of work. Like, you have to tee it up, you have to get people feeling a certain way, and then you, you basically manipulate those feelings. <laughs> and, uh, and it definitely can be done, it's just tricky, uh, and it requires a lot of coordination. Uh, then for environmental storytelling, gosh, I, I know I have examples, but I'm totally blanking. Can you think, I mean, like, there's some cool stuff like The Room, um, but I, I think yeah, the the room the, the room I think is uh, the, the the iOS games um, that I think uh, that that uh, Fireproof makes. Um, I think those are great examples of a lot of storytelling being done purely through the you know purely through kind of interacting with environments where it's like you know that I, I like you'll go into someone's office and you'll find like ways pe things are put together. So yeah, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff that can be done. And I'm like I'm gonna have like a million great answers to this the minute I don't have a microphone anymore. I feel like, but I will say um, it's not environmental storytelling, but a uh, um, a game that really made me feel some stuff and I don't believe had any dialogue was Florence, which came out this year. Did that have dialogue? Uh, it, it had some like semi-dialogue tricks. Yeah, but like it was that. pretty cool. Um, like there's a lot of experimental stuff and it's not even experimental. I mean like look at the beginning of WALL-E, right? Like no dialogue in that and it was really awesome. So absolutely, um, I do believe in how cool that can be. 
even though I feel mortified that I can't think of a great example off the top of my head. So I think we probably have time for one more. I assume somebody will come and, and whack us off the stage when it's time to go. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, so I was wondering, you guys talked a lot about the relationship between a narrative writer and, uh, or sorry, a narrative designer and a writer. And I was wondering, uh, how is it working with more visual storytellers, like uh, character artists and an environment artists, and how did that shape your writing? Uh, especially with you, Molly, since you started out as a concept artist. Uh, you sounded like you had something to say. No, so the, no, so the thing I was going to say is, yeah, like I, that, that's one of my favorite parts of the process is is getting to work with uh, is getting to work with artists because, um, and a lot of that is the phase that Molly was talking about. Or she alluded to at one point, you know, where it's that phase of running around and getting other people excited because there will come those times where the script has been written and there's no writing to do at the moment, and like you know, you can actually go around and talk to other people. And I find that by like talking talking to your artists as early in the process as possible, like even way before they've got you know a scheduled deliverable or anything like that, like just talking to them and getting them excited, and then they can share ideas with you that maybe will get you even more excited. And at a small company or an indie studio, I imagine this sounds kind of ridiculous because everybody's always in the loop all the time. Um, but when you get bigger, it's weirdly easy for different departments to not be as involved as maybe they should be at certain phases. It's a lot of spinning plates up in the air. Um, we mentioned this at student day yesterday, but um, one of the things that I like to do, um, Eric and I would do it, um, and a lot of writers and designers would, and directors, um, would be um, doing a special pitch just for those departments. Um, so we'd actually stand up a version of the outline and we would pitch it live, much like we're kind of pitching to you right now, and uh, let people ask questions, see if they laughed, see if they were sad, see what they said. Um, and it was a w great way of starting to get those departments invested and on board. In terms of actually moment to moment kind of interactions, as a designer, Initially in the pre-production phase, I spend a lot of time with the director and the writer. But once things are starting to move, I equally, I basically space chunks of my day with different departments as much as possible. And some of that is organized through a meeting that's run by a producer or I'll ask to have a meeting scheduled. But a lot of it is, I like to call them drive-bys, which is just stopping by somebody's desk, saying hello. And weirdly, when you just get talk, talking about one thing like, you know, normal stuff, like how was your weekend, blah, blah, blah. Weirdly, it just starts providing opportunities to have normal conversations. Like, what are you working on? Oh my God, that concept looks so cool. Actually, I just heard that this thing in the script was changing, so it might be better if he didn't have a hat. Um, you know, different stuff like that. Or, oh, are we modeling the hair under that hat? Just in case. Um, so, you know, um, I often would have really fun ones with a lot of the environment artists because I planned a lot of the, we used to call them free walks, um, but whenever you're actively exploring a space. And so giving them ideas, like a lot of the times they're just winging it, right? And so um, saying either, wow, that looks amazing, that is exactly what I wanted, um, or like, oh, that's pretty cool, but maybe that window should be, maybe we should put a window in this wall because I think we might want two different ways in and out of this room because when the, pop, when the cops show up, we need to run away or whatever. So a lot of that, Again, you can structure it with scene kicks, kickoffs and things, but I don't like to just rely on those. It's just great to have good rapport with people. Well, awesome. Uh, I think yeah, um, it, 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 it looks like we're just about out of time here. I think we need to stop. Okay. Thank you so much, yeah, thank everybody. Thank you, everybody. Um, <laughs> it was really great.